I'd like to welcome everyone that has joined us today from 36 countries, five continents. Like, wow, really? Cannabis is a global movement. Cannabis is medicine. We have seven investor judges with stellar backgrounds and are joined by additional investors and sources of capital watching from around the world. We have eight companies that will present today to the judges and where they were selected from over 40 companies that applied. We have assembled a great cross section of companies that we'll be presenting today that include both, both private companies and publicly traded companies. So let's start by going over today's schedule and the format of the investor pitch competition. The investor pitch competition will be approximately two hours long and our goal is to educate investors about cannabis, CBD and hemp investment opportunities and connect companies from different industry sectors who are seeking additional growth capital and in the hunt for new investors and sources of capital. Today, we will watch eight innovative companies present to their investment opportunity to a panel of experienced investor judges that are seeking investment opportunities. At the end of the eight presentations, we will learn which companies the investors judges like and if they're motivated to invest. The schedule for today's webinar is as follows. From 1.05 p.m., that's Pacific time, to 1.20 p.m., I will start with the introductions of the investor judges. From 1.20 p.m. to 3.03 p.m., we will have company presentations and question and answer from the investor judges. From 3.03 p.m. to 3.15 p.m., we will have voting by the investor judges and you, the audience, will have an opportunity to vote for the company that gave the best presentation. The judges will each vote for one company and tell us why this is their choice. We will add up the judges' votes to come up with a total and the company that has the most individual judges' votes will be the overall winner of the investor pitch competition. We will announce the investor judges and audience winner. From 3.15 p.m. to 3.20 p.m., we will have a closing announcement by me, John Nomadic. Two, close out the day from 3.20 p.m. to 4.30 p.m., we will be hosting a Zoom room networking, different from this room, Zoom room networking, where you can meet the presenting companies, investor judges, and meet the webinar audience. I really suggest you hang around and go into that event. It's a great place to network. We have a few webinar items to cover. First, if you wanna submit a question, just use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure you're chatting with all panelists and attendees. After the final presentation, the webinar audience will be presented with a pop-up window on your computer where you'll be able to vote for your number one company presentation. To the presenting companies and speakers, I will work to give, bring you questions from the audience. We also recommend that you monitor the chat to answer questions directed to you. As a reminder, you can have access to the presenting companies and the investor judges information and contact information at the Cannabis Investing Forum website, www.cannabisinvestingforum.com. I'll repeat that, www.cannabisinvestingforum, all one word, dot com. Now, format an investor pitch competition. Each company will receive 12 minutes to present and answer questions by judges. Moderator, that's me, will introduce each presenting company. It has rec been recommended that the companies use six minutes of time for presentations and allow six minutes of Q&A from judges. I will be strict with time limits. Judges will raise their hands and indicate if they want to ask a question. Please also send me a private message. And I apologize sincerely in advance if I miss any of your questions. Judges are requested to have one question for each presentation and to keep answers at 90 seconds or less so that we can have three to four investor judges ask questions for each presentation. I will proceed in alphabetical order by first name. And from there, I will give each judge one minute or less to introduce themselves. So I'd like to start with 
Carol Ortega Algara, Managing Director, Muisca Capital Group. Carol, please take it away. Give us a one minute or less introduction about yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Ortega. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, John, for, for putting together this amazing networking. Um, I'm representing family offices, angel investors, uh, and in general terms, uh, accredited investors from Latin America. We are interested in companies that are post-revenue, so you need to have some historical income already in your financial statements. We are interested in companies that are already listed in, in under the SEC, uh, United States Securities Exchange Commission. And we are also interested in companies that are looking to um, do their IPO this year. So if you have those three requirements, feel free to contact us at info at muiscacg.com. Thank you. That's great, Carol. And by the way, for any of you that don't, don't know who Carol is, if you want to do anything in Colombia in the cannabis space, I strongly suggest you start with her. She knows anybody who's worth knowing in the sector. Now, on to Cletus Mack, CEO, Cannabis Venture Partners. Cletus, please take it away. Hello, Cletus Mack. I don't hear you. You're muted. Okay. Let's go to the next judge and then I'll introduce Lee Cletus later. Uh, David Cram, co-founder and managing director, Profarian Sapling. Hey guys. David, please take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Um, very lucky to be here today. Really appreciate ev everyone showing up. I'm actually located in Las Vegas today, but I live in Los Angeles. Um, I, like you said, I'm the co-founder and managing director of Profirian Sapling. Basically, we are a real estate investment firm that helps cannabis companies acquire and build out facilities. What we always like to say is the value of a cannabis company is not necessarily just in its license. It's also in its real estate because without real estate, there is no company. So we help companies find real estate, buy it and lease it back to them. We also invest um, and help advise plant touching companies and run investment syndicates for companies looking to raise capital. So we're not just a real estate firm. We will also look at deal flow for up and coming and emerging plant touching businesses from coast to coast. I've been in cannabis for seven years. I'm a former Wall Street analyst that luckily left the world of Wall Street to do this much more exciting industry. Yeah. Um, and I haven't looked back since. So I really appreciate everyone for joining us today. And if you have any questions um, about raising capital, investing, um, or preparing to raise capital, feel free to get in touch. I'll post a link to my LinkedIn on the chat. That's great, David. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Oh, listen, good to see you. First time I've seen you here. I've done a few of these events. Welcome. Thank you so now, much. Oh, my pleasure. David Wise, chairman and founder of Infinity. David, please take it away. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, I, I come into the industry since 2017. Uh, Infinity was formed at, primarily as a bulk distributor to supply uh, the, the needs of the brands and manufacturers in order to create their products. Um, we're here today because we're always interested in uh, acquisitions that make sense that augment our current business model, which is uh, distribution based. Uh, one of the areas that we are exploring even more are those looking to create brands. So we'd be primarily interested in companies that uh, have a brand that they developed, but are seeking to expand it, especially in the California market where we are a licensed distributor. Uh, we are also expanding into the state of Illinois and are waiting for those licenses to be issued as we become a multi-state operator. Uh, Carol, you and I may want to talk sometime because we are, we're also purchasing a Colombian company. In the meantime, you know, my background, people call me Dr. D because I have a PhD in organizational leadership and management. Uh, my master's in business, as well as a law degree, uh, primarily transactional based. So I look forward to hearing from all the panelists and hopefully asking some thought provoking uh, questions that help them move forward or at least uh, get them on the table for investments. 
Hey, thank you, David. Uh, FYI, as you probably already know, I'm also invested in Columbia as well in the cannabis space. So on to Dr. John Thompson, founder and CEO, Extract Lab. Uh, Dr. John, please take it away. Um, you may be muted. How's that? Better. <laughs> yeah. My sign All language right. is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so there's a little bit of an echo here, but I think it should be able to, uh, to do this. No problem. So uh, my name is Dr. John Thompson. Um, I'm founder and CEO of Extract Lab and uh, United Science. Uh, we've put hundreds and hundreds of people into the businesses of uh, hemp and cannabis. And, um, you know, the, the feedback is terrible. <laughs> Hang on just a second. If I can get that. Um, yeah, so uh, we put uh, hundreds of people into the business of um, basically, um, you know, building out products for the marketplace, and uh, it's been a very rewarding time. We started in 2014, and uh, my company has built up uh, uh, about 10 different equipment brands. Uh, we do consulting for the entire industry. Um, our company is always looking for the latest and greatest in technology. I know there's some technology companies here. Um, we're doing a lot of investments right now in medical packaging, single use medical packaging. Um, and we, we also have uh, a tremendous number of clients that we deal with. Um, a lot of the big co corporations up in Canada, for example, the public companies, um, we put a lot of those guys into the extraction business. Um, and uh, of course, there's always uh, there's always a cross pollination between you know technologies. They're looking for a lot of those medical technologies as well. So, um, I have uh, a PhD in analytical chemistry. That's my background. Um, and uh, you know, we've we've just been really at the grassroots of the industry. Um, I was co-founder of Vireo Health, which is a current state uh, multi-state operator. Um, they're operating in uh, several. Uh, states right now. And, um, and that's really my background. So I'm very interested in hearing all the presentations today and, uh, and good luck to all the um, pitchers. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. I called you Dr. John earlier in the Latin style, which is we refer with an honor with a honorific. We always start with the first name. I think I've been down here too long, you know, lots of cervezas, that's for sure. Um, on to Ted Bernhardt. Pleasure speaking with you again, Managing Director Cultiva Law. Yep. Ted, Pleasure. please take it away. Thank you. Pleasure speaking to you again as well. Uh, as you may have seen on my earlier introduction, uh, Ted Bernhard, Managing Director of Cultiva Law. Cultiva Law is a uh, cannabis only business law firm uh, in the West Coast, uh, up and down from Seattle, Portland, where I am, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, our primary Client base is entrepreneurs in the space and investors uh, as well. Um, a lot of the the, the uh, people come to us looking for uh, investment opportunities, ranging from angel investors to venture capital, private equity, uh, later stage investing, real estate, all that sort of stuff. So uh, I'm primarily a service provider, but uh, a lot of our clients are uh, invested in this space and. Like I said before, before I um, practiced law, I actually was was, was a partner in, in, in four different uh, investment funds as well. So um, looking forward to the presentations today and thanks for inviting me. My pleasure to have you here, believe me. And now on to uh, Zach Bernion or Bergon. I apologize if I butchered your name in French, I would say it's Bergnon. Uh Real estate acquisitions, cannabis venture partners. Zach. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I apologize. I think my background was wrong. But anyways, I am the chief of real estate for cannabis fit biz venture partners, um, specializing in license acquisition sales, real estate sales, um, kind of anything to do with the real estate and licensing side of cannabis. Um, we're mostly looking for 
cannabis companies that are looking for funding or need joint venture partners to come in and assist them. That's great, Zach. By the way, just an FYI, um, your background, um, I'm not seeing you clearly having a green screen issue. Well, you know, deal with just, it as you okay. wish. Oh, that's actually a lot better. There <laughs> what a handsome guy. Jeez. He's just Wonderful. In. Jeez. What a yeah. great smile. So, anyways, on to Cletus Mack, CEO, Cannabis Venture Partners. Cletus, please take it away. How you doing? I'm I'm in Vegas. I just had to check out of my room, move into the next spot. But I'm here. Sorry for the background, guys. No worries. Good to see you. Okay, great. If you wanted to add anything else, Cletus, if not, you can do it later. We'll give you time. No worries. So now let's go to the presenting companies and let's start with our first presentation. And presenting company number one, Car Claudia Post, founder and CEO, Scarlet Express. You have 12 minutes. Suggest you take six minutes for your presentation, six minutes for Q and A. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Claudia Post, and um, I am really excited to be here because I'm going to be speaking about two of my passions. One is, of course, cannabis. The other is transportation. I owned a very large transportation company. I had twelve warehouses up and down the East Coast. Uh, I had about 1,500 to 2,000 drivers at one time. And so I think that gives me the gravitas to talk about transportation, logistics, supply chain, chain of custody. Some of my clients were marquee clients like University of Pennsylvania, Duke University. So we moved anything within those systems, whether it's medical and actually we moved organs. So if you, God forbid, were on an operating table, I would have been able to deliver your heart. Um, so my background is wide and deep. I served on every national board of um, trade associations. So I have many, many nationwide contacts. And then I morphed into cannabis. I opened up a company called Most Consulting Group, which is located here in Philadelphia. Our niche uh, practice is cannabis companies nationally and internationally. So two loves, cannabis and transportation. And one day I was sitting at my desk and I said, duh, slap them together, girl, and create a delivery service. Now, I understand how one cannot just pick up and drive from Philadelphia to LA. That's not going to happen. I understand all the background. We do work for dispensaries. So I'm aware of all the rules, all the regs, all the things that we have to do. So if you combine all of that knowledge, Scarlet Express is a real winner. And the reason is I understand the logistics. I understand the insurance. I understand and have contacts, as I say, all over the country. So if I were dealing with a large MSO and they said, I have 32 locations, no problem. I'm there, I have to pick up a phone and I believe in the McDonald's approach. So whatever we're doing in Philly, we're gonna do in Chicago, we're gonna do in Dallas and we're gonna do in LA. I get the business on both ends. The other piece on the other leg of my stool, of course, is the fact that I own a marketing agency. I'm not gonna to have to go out and say, oh my God, I need a website. I need a brochure. I need to how to figure out how to go to market. We do mark, go to market strategy. We do brand strategy. So if you want to see my other company, it's mostconsultinggroup.com. So now on with our, let me get to my next slide. I hate when I'm not supposed to be doing this. Okay, keep going. Okay, here we are. So first off, I'm not going to start to tell you about uh, the industry. I don't have to tell you $130 million and all that other stuff. I want to bring you up to speed about what I understand about the industry, which is, of course, a discreet, secure, and compliant delivery. And that is the most important thing. One of the things that drove me to be able to pick up from the dispensary, deliver to the patient, is compassionate care. And next, as we go and we morph into uh, states that are recreational, which is wonderful, 
Um, we're going to be able to do various other things. We're going to be picking up at um, a store, dispensary store. And I use the example of uh, Governor Paul Murphy and New Jersey, who's not gonna buy his ounce of bud and he's not gonna go stand in the line. The store is gonna call us and we're gonna deliver. So we have two revenue streams here where possible. The other thing is, is that I have a deep, deep, deep understanding of air, ocean and ground. I can bring in freight from anywhere on the globe, and that's a whole other slice of me. And people say, gee, I didn't realize when we started with the marketing company that we're going to get a transportation expert, but there you have it. That's who I am. Let's talk a little bit about my team. Um, the team has a combined, uh, I guess, you know, somebody said, you know, dog years, um, 12 years in the industry. Uh, all of the people that are on my team are professionals, they understand delivery. And then of course we have John Monk. We have a next, uh, the next group of folks are our advisors. We have Lynette who's marketing and communications and been in government for a very long time. Joe Henderson, Trisha Muller is also a political person. She knows where to go. She's in New Jersey. She's, and then of course my last person is my very good friend, Ken Wolf who is a security expert. So in terms of all of the things that we need to be successful, I have covered what I believe are all the bases. Now, the problem, dispensaries don't deliver. I, I say that because running a delivery service is a completely separate industry. It's Delivery is not just pick up and deliver. There are so many other things that go along with it. Our technology will allow for absolutely, I'm going to say this, so I, I'm going to do, I don't want to do transportation speak. You'll be able to input your desired delivery. If you're an existing patient, all of your patient information will be stored there. Hey, I do, you know, $200, I buy, out, I buy an ounce, I buy this, whatever, it's all there. And you can replicate that uh, over and over again. It really cuts down on uh, the industry, uh, the, 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 in the, I'm so sorry. It, 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 it cuts down on the intrusion for the customer or the patient. So I don't need to tell you it's a $130 billion industry. So we're gonna move on from that. This deck was created for other folks. Now I will be able to accomplish, as I said, a nationwide door-to-door -door delivery. Why? Because I can scale this because I was on every transportation board in the country because I have a very well-known and a, a reputation in the industry. So I can pick up, as I said, I can pick up the phone and call anybody in terms of the discretion, the security and everything else. We're there, okay? We know what we're doing. So next. This is the life cycle. Six minutes left, by the way. Okay. Uh, oh, gosh. Okay. Let me hurry up. This is the life cycle of a delivery. I spoke about it. Let's go. Next slide. Okay. This is the, <laughs> this is the landscape. We all know it. I don't have to spend my time here. Okay. Now, we have the logistics knowledge. We have the technology. We have the branding and the marketing, and we have the sales. We are cannabis industry experts, and we know how to deliver controlled substances. Okay, we're time critical door to door, secure track and trace, and we absolutely have a great idea of what it will take to actually execute on all these. I'm very proud to say, and very excited, um, I, this is my dream, and that's not kidding. When, I, when this came to me, I said, I really want to do this because I know it. It's like I know the back of my hand. I know deliveries. I mean, not a lot of other gals get excited when they see a tractor trailer on a highway, but I do. <laughs> or they have a warehouse. So anyway, that's us. Um, and I guess it's time for questions. Where are they? Hey, judges, you have a question? Anybody want to lead off? Okay, Carol, we'll start with you. Okay, uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, great presentation. Thank I you. missed uh, the financial information. Can you please uh, tell me if you have a historical... Yes, I have a financial slide. Income? Absolutely. Okay. 
Let me get and, let me pull that up. Okay. And what there it is. There you go. Instrument. I'm going to answer your question right there. This is, I took a snapshot of the state of Pennsylvania. And all of this obviously has been researched. If you look at, so right now today, and of course it changes on a daily basis, 482,000 patients. I said 20% will want a delivery. You know, don't hold me to that. Hopefully it's a, a lot more. And then we have two deliveries per month. That is the average delivery per month after a lot of research. We will be charging $20 per order. Now, if you see what we're doing here at the bottom of the screen and the explanation, this is pre-tax, this is profit, you know, obviously pre-tax. And um, it takes into account, well, I have the financials, I've got the spreadsheets. If you want to see them, I'd be happy to send Great, them over Claudia. to you. Uh, so are you, are you offering a convertible note? What is the interest, the discount? And what is the minimum investment? Did you ask about a convertible note? Is that what you said? I'm so sorry. My uh -huh. computer's yeah. acting up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Convertible Three note? Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. Convertible okay. note. Really uh, quick. Interest rate. Yeah. Discount and the minimum investment. Yeah. Well, okay. So what I say to every investor, and so far I've raised about $175,000, you know, friends and family seed round. Um, I say to them, what kind of investment model are you used to? And I will absolutely entertain um, that person's desire. So um, I would be happy to talk to you about this afterwards. And like I say, I've got all the financials. So if there's another question, I'm so sorry, I ran over. Uh, David so Wise, excited. did you have a question? Uh, yes, a couple of them actually. Um, for, I didn't get to see the financials, so I don't, I don't know if I can take a look at those real quick. I'll have a question on that. Um, so your experience in, you're looking to be a delivery service. Is that what you are looking to do? Yes, I will be a transportation provider from the dispensary to the patient or from the store, if you will, to- And what um, states? Any state you want me to be in, which is what I said. Because okay, so what, do you, been, what do you do? What do you do with states like California, where most every dispensary does deliveries? Well, there are lots and lots and lots of delivery services in California. There are, and lots of them are failing. Well, then I'll buy them. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> then I'll roll them up. I've done. A, I did a roll up before. I can do a roll up again. Okay, David for, Graham, you want to squeeze a quick one in? Yeah, let me squeeze a quick one in. Um, my problem with delivery, and this is not just cannabis delivery, this is any on-demand delivery, is with unit economics and the lack of scalability. If you're a driver and you can only make a maximum of three deliveries per hour, hypothetically, no. tell me how that scales. Okay, here we go. I've got an answer for you too. <laughs> um, Great. All right. I'm looking so forward to it. The model, the model is, is that we will deliver a five-mile radius from the dispensary, okay? Five to six, depends. An average driver wants to make between 150, I'm giving you broad strokes here, between 150 and 200. Uh, 30 more seconds, Claudia, sorry. Am I done? No. 30, yeah, 30 seconds. Uh -oh. Does that help? David, you know, I'm certainly, yes, I have the answer for that. The, I know what the drivers need to make. Remember, I had maybe at one time 2,000 drivers. And I would love to talk to you offline about that. Help me better understand. I like the delivery business. However, I can never wrap my head around the economics. I'll be happy to help. Thank you so much. All right. I guess that's me. It's a wrap. Thank wonderful, you, everybody. Wonderful. Okay, Thank that's you. great. Thank so, you. So time to move on to presenting company number two. And it's Elad Barak, co-founder and CEO of Voyager. Uh, Elad, please take it away. Elad, by the way, is no stranger to Cannabis Investing Forum. Good to see you back. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me and really interesting conversation so far. One second, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me again. And we have a lot of uh, interesting updates to share. So I'm just going to dive into it and uh, then go to the Q&A. So, we always like to start before uh, we talk about Voyagers, just to talk about the industry quickly and mention, some, mention one thing that all of us tend to kind of uh, forget. And that is the fact that when we look at the numbers of 
how many people actually consume cannabis, the majority of the population still doesn't consume cannabis. And when we want to go and look at the reasons why, uh, the main five reasons that come up are all around two kind of topics or issues. One is the control and dosing issue that people don't want to overdose. And two is people don't want to smoke and vape. And the Voyager solution answers both of those things. So our, our solution is a pocket-sized dispenser uh, for cannabis uh, or any other liquid that form. But in cannabis, we have two products that we can work with. One is oil drops. Those are the same regular oils that you put sublingually and we are all familiar with and beverage drops. And those are the drops that you can add to a beverage mix and get a cannabis beverage. And the way it works is very easy. You take our dispenser, this is a one-time purchase. You connect the pod to it. You dial in your dose. There's a small screen, so you can choose how many milligrams you want. You press the button and you get an accurate dose uh, to your beverage or again, sublingually if you want. It's simple, precise, portable, and gives you all the control you want as a cannabis consumer. Uh, this is all based on our patented um, we're patent pending on our patent pending technology, and we've just received about a month and a half ago our first uh, review from the PCT. That's the international filing. Um, fairly well, really small comments. We already replied to it and updated also the American submission. So things are going really good from that perspective. Um, we also conducted a market research to kind of better understand if what we're doing really answers the challenges that consumers have. And we were very pleased to find out that when we presented this concept to uh, different consumers and we did a big market research with insights, they, they saw that it's precise, simple, and portable. But above all, they gave our product value. And this is not related to the cost of the product, but actually to the fact that it answers the, the things they need. The other interesting part was the intent to purchase was very high amongst uh, current users. And the more, if you kind of divide the more the, uh, into smaller groups, the higher the consumption rate, the higher the interest to purchase this. And this is completely in line with other concepts that consumers are familiar with. Uh, so really good, great results. Now, the way our business works is we sell these pods empty to different cannabis companies. They fill it with their cannabis, they put their own brand in it, uh, and they sell it through their distribution channels. And what we kept here in the financials is just to show that our pod cost goes into their COGS, uh, which still keeps them on a 60% uh, gross margin, which is what most uh, cannabis companies aim for. And, and with that in mind, I, I wanna take you to our financial projections. And this is looking on our first market that has 35 million uh, population. And within three years, we can reach $35 million revenue. Uh, this is using the assumption that we'll have six recreational partners with us selling those pods. And we make, again, from that uh, COGS, that's where we divide our revenue from. Now, the interesting part about Voyager is our scalability. Because even if you want to argue our numbers up or down a, a bit, the scalability is what matters here. The fact that we do not touch the plant means there's no border. So we can go to Canada, to the States, to Europe, or any other country we want. The fact that we're doing hardware means the higher the quantity, the lower the cost. This is not a plant or something else. In each local market, we work with local uh, partners, kind of like a franchise or franchisee to manage that local ecosystem. We have a very low setup cost for uh, different partners that want to work with us. We essentially developed our product to be fillable by the same machines that fill vape machines, just because most companies will have that already. And if not, it's a $50,000 device. And last but not least, we like work with local brands uh, to have quick organic growth. Now we're here raising a million and a half US dollars at a 6 million pre-money valuation. And we have two main goals with our raise. The first is to finalize our manufacturing capabilities so we can go to market and we expect to do that in half a year after we fundraise. And the second one is launch in the lead market. Now, once we finish fundraising, we can continue kind of rolling the, the capital and increasing our expansion within the markets. Just quickly from a milestone perspective, so we've passed Health Canada approval last year. We can start selling this product in Canada if we want. We've signed, uh, this is not updated, we have now a few partners that we signed here in Canada uh, to work together. We're working towards sensory testing with one of the licensed producers. So they're gonna test it with an expert panel and we're getting ready for full-scale manufacturing and being on the market um, later this year, early 2022. 
And last thing I want to mention before we kind of sum this up is when we did our market research, we also asked consumers, where else do you see this used? And we were very happy to see that they all went to uh, very interesting fields such as vitamins, medication, caffeine, caffeine drops, essential oils. And what's important to mention here is that we're starting in the cannabis industry, but again, we're a hardware company and our technology can apply also in health and wellness and pharmaceuticals and psychedelics. So we definitely see this going to other places. Uh, so with that, I'll leave it for questions. Thanks. What a pro, good work. So who would like to start? Who would like to ask the first question? Okay, Dr. John Thompson, you have the floor. John, you're on mute. Unmute. There we go. Can you hear me now? That's good. Okay, good. Um, hey, good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so can I ask you, what is your, are you going to wholesale these to uh, the various uh, companies and, and what's that purchase price? I didn't see it. It was at $5. Yeah. So, so the idea is that instead of trying to have our own brand and once we prove yeah. that this delivery method is successful, have people trying to compete with us, we want to just own the platform. So okay. we want to work with the other brands. Um, for the cost of the pot itself or the companies, it varies depending on the milligrams they, uh, they want to put inside. And we have a way to kind of control and monitor that. So they can just you know, say they want to put 100 milligrams and then put 1,000. But we vary the price according to that. And we've been through the process with a few licensed producers here in Canada. And they're all good with the price. What are your gross margins? Our gross margins are around 60% as well. And have you sold any of these yet? No, so we're pre-revenue. Um, we have a few uh, deals lined up, as I mentioned, for once we, we have the product. Um, right now, we need to finalize our manufacturing capabilities. So we still need to finish the molding. Why not just use a tincture uh, to dose? Why not just use a tincture dropper? Yeah, sure. So, you know, that, that question comes sometimes. Uh, so here in Canada, I would mention that it's out of regulations. You can't have any more of those uh, droppers or syringes. You can actually only have what's called a dosing cap. Uh, but regardless of that, we see a lot of uh, abilities to do other stuff for product. And it's kind of like a lot of people will use a vape pen and not a regular vape, not only because now you're not smoking, also the convenience that is missing with just dealing with dirty stuff like dry leaf or oil. Uh, but we divided the cannabis that's digestible to kind of three product lines. There's oils, soft gels, and edibles. And you can see that only Voyager allows you to, one, really customize your dose because you can't really do that with a dropper, not to the level that we allow you, and then not even the level of accuracy. So we have less than 3% error, meaning that if you want to consume three milligrams, you'll get exactly three milligrams. There's no chance you'll take five accidentally and not understand why your experience is wrong. So does the $5 include the pod and the... Uh, and the dosage unit, or is it, or are those separate? So, so again, we're saying, yeah, that the, that five dollars is all of their cost. Our pot is inside that. That includes their oil and everything they need. Uh, the dispenser itself will be twenty dollars to the consumers, and we're not planning on making any profit from the dispenser. So, the dispenser is a one-time purchase. It has all the electronics, the battery, the power. Um, you know, all the smarts that needs to be done. And the pot is essentially a very sophisticated bottle with a dispensing mechanism that we developed. Okay. Moving on to the next question, um, David Cram. Yes, hey, um, great presentation. Really quick question for me. This is in terms of competitive analysis. Who are your competitors in this space as you see them and how do you believe you are different and or better? Yeah, so, so it's very interesting. I think for us, the competition is either digestible products. There's nobody else that we know that does any dispensing mechanisms. Um, so essentially, it's those three groups, right? Now, we believe that, for example, on the beverage side, a lot of companies went with this approach of let's do ready to drink, but nobody thought maybe that's not the right approach. You know, a lot of people will buy coffee, but nobody will buy it in a can. They will buy it in grains, right, and beans. And the same goes to cannabis. Maybe you just need to dispense it to yourself. It's cheaper, it's more convenient, and it's actually to your wanting. So we're competing with them. We're competing with people that want to have capsules or tablets, but don't want to get exactly five milligrams. They want to be able to say, 
now I need three milligrams and tomorrow I need to take seven. Um, and we're competing with the oil. So we're kind of going to, to have to build to take main consumers for all of them. Do you view Pax Labs as a direct competitor to what you're trying to do? I view them as or one of our bigger options for an exit. <laughs> Love it. Okay, okay. Carol, <laughs> you got but, one but more question. They do Carol? things. Sorry if I can just finish that. Sorry, but they sure, do go ahead. No problem. Go ahead, Carol. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say we, we they do okay, things. So, uh, we do the Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, do you guys have any any project uh, issue or in process? Any student exit strategy and the terms, please. Out there. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. What is your exit strategy? What are the terms? And if you have any patent in process. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with the easy one. That's the patent. We submitted our patent in the States. Um, it's actually dated back to July 2019. Uh, we're patent pending at the moment. We also submitted a PCT, an international patent. We've received the first review. It was really good. We answered a bit and we've also replied also to the US uh, Patent Office to kind of give them those updates. Our patent is already published on Google if you want to search it without those small updates. Uh, but altogether, I would say it's going really well, and, and I believe it will help us protect our product, mainly so when we are going to the medical field. Uh, from an exit perspective, right now we're a private company. As I mentioned, I think there will be a few exits within the cannabis industry, either with the big cannabis companies here in Canada or the MSOs, but also potential companies, I think, like PAX, that understand this business and know what it means to, to own an ecosystem. And where were PAX was when they started. Nobody's doing this. We're the first one building this ecosystem. And even if you have a few other ecosystems eventually like this, the first mover advantage is very important in an ecosystem where you can kind of block competition. Okay. Elad, sorry, we have to wrap it up. That was a great presentation, by the way. Thank Speaking you. only for myself. Um, presenting company number three, uh, Joe Long, president, Surge Automatic. Thanks, John. Surge Automated. Appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Well, thanks for the introduction. And first, I want to comment. It's been a great group. Some of these presenting companies are really intriguing, and I'm excited. Um, but with that, uh, Surge Automated, we are a company that is delivering digital identity and age verification solutions. Um, our vision, oh, I guess, first of all, I should present my deck, John. Minor details, right? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you okay, Joe. If you can find your deck, great. If not, just go ahead. It's, uh, no, it's right here. I just neglected to share. Yeah, no worries. Technical challenges. Okay. So... So as we were talking, our vision is to establish the standard in safety and, and security for all unattended age restricted product sales. And that's very specific here for the cannabis industry. Now, our business mission is to leverage the various industry trends and the market drivers um, so we can capture a share of the roughly 580 million transactions that are taking place in the marijuana category currently. So I want to take a second to touch on some of these trends in the drivers and, and really the inflection point that it's brought us to. So as we all know, COVID has really accelerated uh, leveraging of e-commerce and specifically in marijuana and age-restricted products somewhat in general. Now, the key here is that age-restricted retailers as it relates to e-commerce are facing some, some significant legal challenges. And that comes from existing case law. So Anybody here that's experienced uh, navigating to a website, you see the question, are you 21? That's a self-reported gateway. Um, and case law simply won't support that. In other words, if somebody brings up an issue with a retailer, they will lose. Other issues that we need to really be paying attention to as a result of the expansion in e-commerce, of course, is 
the, the level and rate of fraud, both identity theft, monetary fraud, and of course, then we have the age violation components. So as I mentioned earlier, we have safety and security in setting that standards. And what we're doing to help support both the retailers as well as the ecosystem that supports them, e-commerce providers, logistics and delivery, things of that nature, is taking away the overhead or the burden of what I like to call the alphabet soup of, of regulations. So once age-restricted products have gone into e-commerce, they're now subject to series of regulations that are well outside of the industry in addition to the industry. Um, and we can touch on the alphabet soup whenever you'd like to get into more detail. Now we've also gone further and made it very, very easy for them to install our solution set in any aspect of the digital workflow. So you can establish that security gateway at the point of entry or at the point of transaction. And of course, closing the chain of custody at the point of delivery. Now the underlying magic and how we're helping to protect the consumer is by using layered security, okay? So what we're doing is we're preventing and obfuscating any potential use of personally identifying information, okay? And we're using a tool two key system. In essence, we're identifying and validating the individual against their government ID, confirming that person matches, okay? And then from there, it's a very simple methodology to verify in a digital workflow, this person is who they say they are, and they're of legal age. We also do not share any information. We don't aggregate information to sell downstream. This is truly meant to be a vault, i.e. the name Surge Vault, like security product that individuals can use for this purpose. Now, getting into the business model, uh, we are recurring revenue and we are a software as a service provider. We will be charging a monthly subscription fee and then a per transaction or a verification will range from 50 cents to a dollar. Now that variability comes from the fact that we are a volume-based business. We will be driving the reduced cost to current and new clients as that volume increases while simultaneously increasing our spread or our margin. So we'll, we'll be sharing a portion of that cost reduction. The balance of our revenue will be coming from ancillary elements such as lease revenue from vending units, uh, intelligent locker units, as well as consulting and professional services. Now, our go-to-market roadmap, we've, actually, we've delivered exceptionally well. Uh, about two years ago, we started the journey of sitting down with the Marijuana Enforcement Division here in Colorado, uh, demonstrated our proof of concept, and they completely bought into the efficacy. Uh, subsequently, our solution set and the capacity or capability has been embedded into the Colorado regulations. Uh, product development is progressing exceptionally well, and we've actually advanced in today, we're accepted to the National Association of Cannabis Businesses um, and moving forward our standard for the use of this technology. We're about, we've got three clients that we're actively engaged in as part of our pilot initiative, and we're now moving forward with conversations around some of these ecosystem providers like e-commerce, POS, and things of that nature. Now our competition, this is not a new industry. It has been in general com commercial use for mm, 11 years or so since about 2010. I heard some of the folks here have got some background in financial services or FinTech, um, which was my background. So this may sound somewhat familiar to you. GB, uh, GBG, FraudNet, some of these larger global providers have built their technology just like they did in 2010. It's event driven, meaning you do it once, you walk away, you never have to deal with it again. And that's probably good because the older systems are a little burdensome. We've turned that on its head. We're using the same depth of Joe, know your customer. Six minutes. Thank you. We use the same depth of know your customer that the financial institutions use, but we then convert that into a transactional model. Our leadership team briefly, well over 100 years, believe it or not, of experience across fintech, production, consumer products, technology, and marketing and development. Into the numbers, uh, we talked about 580 million available transactions. We've taken a very conservative approach. We're looking at a roughly, assuming a 2% penetration rate, within three years will be well over $11 million. And you can see that uh, scalability and revenue top line is nothing but upside. 
I want to touch that cannabis only represents 580 million transactions. Age-restricted products exceed 3 billion in North America on an annual basis. Everybody has access to the decks. So I'll let you go through those details that, uh, that support our roadmap. Our ask is $1 million broken into trenches based on our business model, or our, I should say our business roadmap. Uh, we can certainly have more conversations about those details uh, offline. Our exit is based on acquisition. The industry has grown over the last 11 years by acquisition in vertical market. We are relying on that and that trend is still continuing forward. And with that, thanks very much for your time. Looking forward to your questions. Okay. Questions? There are hands up, John. Oh, sorry, go ahead, please. Hands are up, John. Ted, Zach. Okay, Ted, uh, if you want to go forward, then we'll take Zach. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, uh, nice presentation. Uh, two quick questions sort of related to the technology and the rollout. So first of all, um, do you have fully operational software right now that is being deployed in uh, in various sites, or or is it just um, you know demoware or uh, alpha beta? What how would you characterize the software? Sure, the, you could literally look to virtually any identity verification software. If you've ever opened a bank account online, there's a process that you have to go through. Um, that is the same underlying technology we're taking and adding a layer on top that creates an account centric methodology. And that's what enables the uh, the transactional component. Okay, great. And then related to that, um, tell me your value proposition relative to sort of the really old school way of just like actually flashing your ID on camera and logging it in the you know spreadsheet or something like that. Why why will people pay for this additional service? No, absolutely. And it's a, it, it's interesting. My fintech background that was a methodology that has been used um, and is still supported from a regulatory standpoint. However. Imagine the consumer experience when you go in, you want to order a product to either go pick it up or to have it delivered. Um, do you want to engage in a web session? Do you want to have a conversation? And how you doing? Most people don't. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Zach? Okay. Uh, yes. So how much money has been spent on the, uh, on the software so far? And then also, what is my return on a million dollars? And how is the million dollars going to be spent moving forward great question so friends and family as well as individual founders and co-founders will have to look at our recent taxes but i think we're about a quarter million in about a hundred thousand in cash uh the million dollar investment over three years uh, we're anticipating at least a 5x quite likely getting closer to a 10x return and the 10x would be closer to the five year Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, if I'm not missing any judges, I guess we could call that a wrap. Uh, good presentation. Um, Great. Thanks. Let's, uh, let's now move on. Oh, by the way, pro tip, I should have said this earlier, but I'll just repeat this. Pro tip, um, I strongly suggest that you have somebody monitor the chats when people are asking questions. So it's just, a, it's just a good idea to have something like that. So let's move on to presenting company numero cuatro, number four, uh, Marcel Gamma, CEO, CBD of Denver. Thank you very much, Sean and team. Uh, great pleasure to joining here, uh, be here tonight. Uh, First of all, thanks to Brad and his team making this possible. I would like to present you tonight uh, CBD of Denver. First, giving you a short overview about the company. I will do with this with a short video we have made uh, about uh, what we have done so far, who we are and uh, what we're expecting to do. Then a little bit talking about uh, our USP uh, with our Swiss investment arm called uh, Swiss, in Swiss Industry Ventures. Uh, making CBD of Denver able to doing investment in Swiss CBD and uh, cannabis com companies, uh, giving you a short overview about our achievements. Uh, let's then afterwards talk about the market potential and, and how we want to pay, participate on that. And uh, finally wrap up short outlook, what we plan to do in the future, near future and uh, middle, uh, middle future and uh, open then for your questions. 
So let's jump. Uh... Okay, so who would like to lead off? I'm just looking at the hands here. And oh, sorry, I. <laughs> no, it's okay, Marcel. By the way, how what's the, what's the weather like in Switzerland? I have to ask you later on. Yeah, it's quite cold. <laughs> I'm strange. in Panama, and the only ice I want to see is in my drinks, my friend. Nothing personal. John, he's okay. ready. <laughs> so, who would like? No, to I hope off? you can see my screen now. Uh, no, not yet, Marcel. Oh, I don't. I don't see it actually. Sorry. There you go. You've got it. Shared. There we go. Okay. Then let's start first with the movie and give you, you a short overview about our company. Okay, great. In 2017, in Switzerland and most European countries, CBD officially got legalized by the government. In the following years, the market increased up to 10 billion euros as of today. It is expected that the market will increase year over year up to 18 billion by 2025. My name is Marcel Gamma and I am the CEO and Chairman of Swiss Industry Ventures. We are a Swiss investment company building and developing private equity investment platforms and we currently are developing one in the area of CBD business named Rockflower Group. The Swiss CBD market currently offers great opportunities to buy existing profitable but undervalued business at a very attractive price. We integrate these companies in our existing setup and develop them extensively by expanding customer base and sales and bringing them into new markets. Additionally, these acquisitions follow the guideline to develop the whole value chain, from seed to customer, for the CBD business in Switzerland and Europe. We have a very professional and diverse team of experts from different areas. CBD business, finance, operations and sales. Our highly motivated, engaged team is key to become one of the top players in the CBD business in Switzerland and Europe. My name is Pascal and I'm the Managing Director of Sales of Rockflowers Group and Board Member of Swiss Industry. My name is Maxim, and of the production here at Rockflower. I'm in charge of the quality for our flowers. The most common is the Harlequin, for example. Um, I have a nugget in my hand. You see the crystals, the smell is amazing. In the blooming stage, we treat our plants with natural nutrition and the best light condition. To not hurt the plants and achieve the best flavors and quality, we only harvest our buds by hand. Rockflower Group has become one of the leading group of companies in the Swiss CBD market. We were able to increase our revenues in 2020 from Q3 to Q4 by more than 40%. That's about $8.5 million. We expect to continue on this level and have budgeted a revenue of $22 million for 21 and are very optimistic to achieve revenue. The Swiss and European market is still in its infancy stage and about 10 to 15 years behind the North American market. Given the roadmap, we will not make the same mistakes again. The Swiss market is expected to increase exponentially in the coming years. We expect a continuous year-over-year -year growth of 20 to 25% in the coming years. So you find us on the internet and you find us also on Instagram. So, this was just to give you, let's say, a uh, first impression about uh, our uh, company and uh, what we're doing with our uh, investments in Switzerland. Uh, with Swiss Industry Ventures uh, offers our CBD of Denver company in the US the great opportunity to invest in uh, the Swiss CBD market, companies in the Swiss and European CBD market, and also, let's say, develop a very interesting business uh, in, in this area. As already mentioned, really, we are, let's say, covering the whole value chain. Uh, we are, let's say, we have companies in the area of production. We going through wholesale. We have uh, companies in the area of uh, retail and B2B, and also in the area of the technology and services. Uh, we really, let's say, follow the guideline from seed to customer. Looking a little bit about the competitive advantage offered by the Swiss market. Let's say uh, Swiss market is a, a very interesting market. Switzerland, it's well known for its high quality. Uh, 
let's say uh, we are in the mid in the heart of Europe, uh, able to deliver uh, CBD, uh, the only company in, in, in by the way in Europe to delivering uh, able to delivering CBD, C C able to grow, produce, and sell product, CBD products all over the uh, European market. We are the only company uh, or the only country in, in Europe uh, which is allowed to grow cannabis up to 1% THC level, which gives us the growth a great opportunity having high, pro let's say, high quality products. We are able to wash down and then uh, export to the rest of the Euro uh, European market. We also, let's say, following the Swiss quality standards, and uh, we have very excellent uh, legal setup in Switzerland, uh, giving us a, 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 yeah, we are already years ahead uh, compared to other countries in, in, in Europe from, from this perspective. Looking a little bit on the achievements we already have done uh, with our uh, investment arm in, in Switzerland, we uh, already have done five acquisitions. Marcel, you have six minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, five acquisitions already successfully implemented. We have an import license for Switzerland. Uh, the uh, expansion to the European market is uh, well on the way. Uh, we have uh, exclusive partnerships with uh, players, Switzerland, Europe, and globally. Uh, also, our product portfolio is covering retail and wholesale. And looking what we have achieved in, in 2020, we were able to... Uh, generate the revenue over 16 million Swiss US dollars with a, a let's say profit margin, net profit margin and net profit of more than 700 uh, 700,000 Swiss uh, US, US dollars. Uh, already in, in uh, first two months of uh, 2021 we achieved the revenue of uh, 4.5 uh, million Swiss uh, US dollars. Looking a little bit on the market, uh, yeah, the, according to uh, the British Office of, Pro, of Pro, Pro, Prohibition Partners, the, they expect the, the potential of the Swiss market by 2028 uh, up to 2.7 billion, where is about 1.3 billion in the medical sector and uh, 1.4 billion in the recreational use. Uh, talking a little bit about our growth strategy, uh, we are very strongly in building brands. Uh, as you have seen, Rockflower is our main brand. We are focusing on and uh, we are, let's say, positioning all our companies uh, in under this brand. No, short words about uh, uh, the investment opportunity we're offering to our, uh, let's say, investors and companies, uh, uh, let's say, investors in in, in interested in investing in our company. Le looking on the Swiss market, uh, the Swiss market is 10, 10 to 15 years behind the US and Canadian market, but through our, let's say, bridge and uh, uh, excellent connections to the US market, we can uh, use the, the know-how, the knowledge uh, there to really, let's say, be ahead uh, according to other companies uh, in, in our area. Uh, we have already two additional large projects uh, in an advanced planning stage and uh, looking on the multiples possible in this area as per Haywood Capital, uh, it's about 12.4 12 times the enterprise value uh, uh, we uh, can, can buy these companies here in Switzerland. So this was just a little bit about uh, our, yeah, our setup we have here and now opening for open for questions from your side we have uh three minutes left and i just want to say marcel that was an outstanding video i'm really impressed and as far as i'm concerned i'm concerned swiss chocolate will never be the same so <laughs> leading on uh i had dr john thompson i believe that wanted to ask a question and anybody else that wants to put up their hand go ahead please you're on mute How many uh, retail outlets do you uh, service right now? So we have uh, uh, one uh, own uh, outlet and we already have uh, agreements with uh, large uh, retail providers in Switzerland and, and uh, uh, expanding now to Europe. 
one of the our partners they are let's say they are in the uh, we call it kiosk these are let's say small uh, shops uh, at uh, train stations and they have about 550 outlets uh, in in switzerland and we are just under negotiation with another partner the spa group they are uh, let's say in switzerland uh, they have by their own about 200 to 300 uh, outlets and uh, they are let's say uh, strongly uh, heavily expanding all over europe so how many currently uh, 100 or, or five or 10 or how, how many have right now? One is our own. We have, uh, we own, uh, own by our own and we have partnerships with uh, these uh, 200 to three, uh, 250 to 300 from the partner. So you're, you're doing 22 million out of one store. I, I guess I'm not, I'm not picking it up. I don't know where, how, how you're making the money then. Sorry. You know, John, John, sorry, but I'm going to give, ask you to yield to Ted, give a couple of other people sure. a chance, but certainly take those questions offline. And, and Marcel, I encourage you to connect, please. So Ted? Yep, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, uh, very nice presentation. And wow, this is a great opportunity. Uh, the yeah. question I have is, could you please clarify the, um, the, what the investment vehicle is. I see CBD of Denver and Swiss Industry Ventures. Are we are we investing directly in a foreign company if we do this or through a US entity or what? what is, can you just talk very quickly about sort of what the structure is? As the, the structure is as follows. Uh, CBD of Denver is uh, uh, the publicly traded company in, uh, in the US and you're doing an investment in the CBD of Denver uh, and uh, uh, Swiss Industry Ventures is our, in, is our investment arm in Switzerland allowing us to, to buy uh, let's say Swiss and then European CBD companies at a very interesting uh, uh, okay. for a very interesting value, because uh, let's say in compared to the U.S. market in Switzerland, we buy uh, one to two times the the, well, uh, the, the, the value of, of the revenue uh, and uh, and um, to to buy a company. So, Did you say uh, CBD of Denver is publicly traded? Is that what? It's an OTC market today. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have to wrap this up. Zach, I, if you want to ask a quick question, last 30 seconds, Marcel, 30 seconds, and we have to move on. Okay. He's on mute. <laughs> Zach, you're on mute. My apologies. Uh, what is your guys' current square footage of canopy and what type of cultivation are you guys doing? Uh, outdoor greenhouse are you guys messing with any high quality indoors at the moment yes uh, uh, our production is focusing on on high quality indoor here in switzerland which is uh, let's say it's, it's it's the main focus but we have uh, partners uh, doing uh, outdoor uh, and greenhouse but uh, our own production is only indoor excellent thank you we've got to wrap it up thank you very much marcel and uh no, and since it's GMT plus one, it's probably time for a good schnapps. Great chat and great having you presenting here. Um, for their next company, presenting company number five, Nate Nuhas, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, founder and CEO, Fast Flower Farms. Nate Nihus, take it away, please. You're pretty close. It's Nihus. Everyone Nihus. Okay. it. Uh, right, got it. Thank you. No worries, man. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, everybody. Um, some pretty uh, rock star presentations here. Sure. Hard to follow. Um, all right, so we're Fast Flower Farms. We're called Fast Flower Farms. If anyone here understands the economics behind actual cultivation, one of the things you quickly learn is that how fast your genetics flower and still maintain quality uh, matters from a cash flow perspective. Um, we merge science and art to create artisanal cannabis products, not craft. Um, the Michigan cannabis market, which is where we're located, uh, is, is absolutely crushing. We beat projections last year by $150 million. It's a $3 billion market now. We have the highest average basket size in the US. Um, Current status, we also have a genetics branch of our company. Genetics are the engine of the cultivation car. Um, we're cash flowing that right now. Uh, state municipal license approval, $250,000 in income coming in December. We own the underlying real estate and all the assets on it. Uh, deeply experienced team 
and we've put 800k into it already through friends and family and uh, founding partners and we have 250k closing this month uh this is it was it was land now it's a now it's a facility uh and we will be operational next month it's a three billion dollar opportunity up in the top right you'll see what we have what leaflink did us a big favor um the the actual growth state by state uh 342 percent which is you know 10x over what california did um it's going to continue to grow we have 300 300 growth remaining branding super important uh we're not just cultivation uh we are a brand um the brand ends up being a lot of your ip um along with sops genetics things like that uh and those are the things that can scale and move state to state so while we are obviously focused on michigan we're going to go pretty deep in michigan it's a big market uh the things that scale are brands genetics and sops um consumer experience innovation is a big deal uh you don't see a lot of flight boxes around here but we're doing it um, then we move into, you know, if somebody tries our products, uh, one of our four chosen cultivars, I have a genetic cultivar library of about 500. Um, we flowered for, they fit our agronomic data, our agronomic models, uh, and, and then obviously they're very high quality. Um, and then extracts and concentrates, solventless, we're also an extractor, uh, but solventless uh, specifically. We don't, we don't use solvents in any of our extraction. Um, that's the fastest growing and highest margin uh, kind of uh, carve out of the extracts market. And obviously, extracts market is a very fast growing market. 20 years in the hands-on cultivation experience just between my guys. That doesn't include my cultivation experience. Um, I have another five years on that. Uh, exceptional business leadership. This is my third startup, uh, second one that I've owned. Inclusive genetics. Genetics, the genetics we have on hand. We have, we have a library of 500 cultivars on hand right now. Um, we have developed genetics over about 10 years. So my, my operations guy was the chief geneticist behind the Emerald Cup product supply company. You guys may have heard of the Emerald Cup, I suspect. Um, and uh, so we develop, he developed these genetics uh, specifically that yield very well in solventless production, uh, which is a big deal. We don't have to scale the brand or we can scale the brand more quickly than we can actually scale the build out of the cultivation facility um it's a lot faster uh the brand is it, the, the brand is, is 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 fast to scale whereas the cultivation facility itself takes time and a lot of capital to build out consumer experience innovation we've talked about that and then solvent extraction um Anybody who knows anything about cannabis on the on the extraction side knows the powerhouse of solventless is, how important it is, and then how difficult it is. Um, if you don't if you don't have the knowledge, the SOPs, and mo most importantly the right genetics, uh, you fall flat on your face. On the other hand, if you know these things, uh, you can absolutely crush it. The margins here are very very high. Uh, here in Michigan, there's only one of the solventless company. They were just picked up by by a company called Pincana. Um, so we would effectively be the only other solventless company here in Michigan. This is the team. They say you don't bet on the horse, you bet on the jockey. Um, I'm U.S. Army combat vet. Uh, coming back from combat, I, you know, it, it was a rough tour. Uh, so there was a lot of insomnia. There was a lot of pain. Um, one of the things that definitely helped that was cannabis. Obviously, you can't use it in the military, and that's something I'm, uh, I'm pretty adamant about changing. Mike Angelotti, uh, this is the, this is one of the, the, a lot of the brains behind the operation. He's been doing solventless extraction for seven years uh, in California under the Emerald Cup Product Supply Company. He's bred all these genetics, and he ran a 22,000 square foot facility there for 10 years. Um, Zach Heinitz, he's been doing, he's been doing cannabis cultivation here in Michigan a little over 10 years. We call him the plant whisperer. And then advisory board are a lot of important people that we take advice from. Proformas, 2021, 1 1.4, 2022 jumps up because we have solvents on the shelves. That's, you got six minutes. Yep. That's the jump is, uh, is the solvents. The buys around terms. Um, we're raising 1.2. We are 300, uh, we 250 in and 300 soft circles. Uh, convertible debt, great terms, 35% discount and a val cap of 10 million. Uh, the val cap and the discount work together, uh, which is also relatively rare. Also, there's a preferential payback. 
Um, in that no common stock shareholders can receive any cash dividends until uh, principal plus interest is paid back at the point of conversion of the convertible debt. Questions? Questions, anyone? Okay, David Wise, go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Nate, thanks for the uh, presentation. Uh, tell Sumit, I said hello. <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I'm trying to understand, is it that you're growing genetic specific for solventless extraction and that's where you're looking to expand? We, we've already done all of that homework. It takes many years to get that right. Um, that gives us a significantly higher yield in solventless than anybody else. Um, an average yield in solventless is about 3%. Ours mm -hmm. do anywhere from four and a half to seven. And are you doing that uh, just strictly from the plant? Or are you doing fresh frozen? Are you extracting CO2 fresh by frozen, resin? Fresh frozen, 100%. It's all live rosin. We don't do any distillates. We are uninterested in adulterating the plant. Um, and we just provide the highest quality stuff. I, we, will, we don't sacrifice the quality. And in this market isn't really in existence yet in Michigan, you're saying? At all. Okay. All right, those are my questions. Great, David Cram. Hey Nate, uh, also uh, tell Sumit I say hi as well. Uh, seems like he knows a bunch of us. Um, is the opportunity here on the solvent list or is it on cultivation or both? Like what's your core competence? Both. Maybe I Maybe I answered that question. And in terms of scalability, tell me how you scale into your revenue projections from a cultivation standpoint. So a throughput of biomass for your extraction. 100%. So, so there's, there's two ways that the revenue really, that two things that really move the revenue needle. One of them is, out, is, is effectively becoming a white label solventless uh, producer. Um, and that, that generates a lot of revenue because people just don't know how to do it. Um, the other thing is we have the, the genetics division that sells to licensed uh, horticulturalists uh, in, the, in the Michigan cannabis market here. Uh, and then the third one is indeed cultivation. Now that biomass, we have genetics that perform very well outdoors. Uh, and we can take the outdoor product, which is the lowest value cannabis product, and turn it into solventless, which is the highest value cannabis product. So you have a margin that's absolutely massive. Wouldn't you just focus all of your time and energy on doing just that if that's where the margins are? Yes and no. Um, having your having a single source garden is really important for a lot of people, and it gives us a lot of place, a lot of space for R and D, a lot of space for collaboration. It's it's a it's it's a good it's a good thing to have that capacity. Now, there's a lot more margin developed, uh, a lot more margin uh, that that we can continue to develop as we build out. Um, our next phase of production, we're doing indoor, we're indoor right now. Our next phase of actual cultivation is going to be in greenhouses, highly automated greenhouses. Now, so that, so then our margins, so then we don't have to wait on outdoor product. Uh, we can grow something that has a similar cost outdoor, a little bit more, uh, but, but still have those big margins that we control the supply chain, which is the big deal. Awesome. We should connect. We're looking at some stuff in Michigan from a real estate standpoint, specifically indoor cultivation and greenhouse. So let's connect offline. Thank you for your answers. Okay. Dr. John Thompson. John, you might be on mute, man. <laughs> I drive me crazy when I do that. <laughs> Yeah, I was just curious as to how many dispensaries you guys are supplying. And do you have any contracts uh, our, with that uh, since first, you got your building? Yeah, our first rollout is going to be to 10 different dispensaries. Um, we're in conversations about that now. There's a, there's a moderate likelihood that we'll actually be engaged, but we have to see about that. Okay. Um, any more questions? If not, uh, you have 30 seconds to wrap it up, Nate. Any questions, anyone? Uh, no, go ahead, Nate, please. Absolutely. So um, we are $250,000 in. We are uh, 300 soft circled for, for this month. We got a couple of big guys that, that I think are going to come in and take a big bite. Um, we are specifically looking for, we turned away a little bit of capital. We are specifically looking for uh, people who can add real value to this. We're calling it our advisory round for, for a reason. Smart money makes a difference here. 
Um, so if, if anybody here has a connection that would be good for this, I would also very much appreciate that. And that's a wrap. Great, good, good presentation, Nate. Good for you. And your country thanks you for your service. And now they should allow you to take your product freely without restraint. Because after all, cannabis is medicine. And whatever mental health issues may, any of some of us may have, I'm talking about myself, uh, it's uh, drugs are not drugs. It's a mental health issue. It's not a criminal issue. Anyways, off my soapbox. Sorry. My wife deals with veterans. So on to the next one. Um, presenting company number six, Noah Sayers. CEO, Bud Buddy. You have the floor, Noah. Hello. Yeah, hi, hey, Noah. How are you doing? I see, your, I see your computer screen. Yep, there it is. Yep, I'm just trying to get the uh, perfect. Can everyone can everyone see the uh, the pitch deck slide? Yep. Okay, perfect. Oh, my uh, my video is not on. One moment. Take your time. Uh, whoops. What is? Perfect. Um, all right. So, can everyone see the the slide now? I see the desktop. Okay, my, my apologies. One moment, let me, perfect, what about now? Got it. All right, great. So first of all, uh, I just wanted to thank you, John and, and David and Brad for, for putting this great event on. Uh, my, my name is, uh, is Noah Sayers. I'm the founder and CEO of Bud Buddy. And Bud Buddy's goal is to make cannabis easy in every sense of the word. Um, we do that first and foremost, by making it simple and foolproof for customers to uh, order cannabis products and accessories online. Uh, what sets us apart from our competition is that we deepen our partnerships with dispensaries by providing them with point of sale hardware and software for free. Um, this point of sale software is compliant with whatever state their seed to sale system is in. And this solves a ton of pain points for both the customer and the partner dispensary. For instance, if a customer is ordering on a competitor's online ordering platform right now, that online ordering platform has to work with one of potentially dozens of cannabis specific point of sale systems. This leads to a lot of issues in terms of inventory and product syncing uh, on the actual, on what the customer is actually looking at. So for instance, a product that to the customer appears in stock to the actual dispensary may not be. And this means that the dispensary could lose out on sales and the customer could choose to not order from that dispensary again and have a negative uh, customer experience. Uh, by having a closed loop ecosystem where all the dispensaries on our platform would need to use our point of sale software, we completely solve that problem. It also aligns the incentives between us and the dispensaries correctly because we only make money when they make money. Our business model is that we charge a flat $5 fee per dispensary order. Um, given that the average dispensary in California has about 112 uh, orders a day, that, expand, that creates a significant revenue stream the more dispensaries we onboard. Um, but we don't just stop there. We've noticed that for many of our uh, competitors, the, while they may have cannabis products available for sale, the accessory products are an afterthought. They may have you know, a, a banger or a single brand of white labeled rolling papers available, but if you wanna get a bong or a vaporizer or a grinder or anything that you actually use to consume your cannabis products, you're fresh out of luck. You might as well just you know, go to a smoke shop down the street. And we think it's ridiculous that you can't get everything cannabis related in one place. In our view, it shouldn't be harder to order cannabis products and accessories than it is ordering takeout food. And that's the problem that Bud Buddy solves. Um, what I'd like to do now is briefly take you through a mock-up of the future uh, web portal 
of our platform to give you sort of a better idea, a visual sense of what we're what we're going for. Um, is everyone able to see the the mock-up right now? Um, hello. Not not sure if. Uh, I'm not sure if people are, are hearing this. Um, let me. We can hear you. Okay, okay perfect. I think I think uh, I think I fixed the glitch. Yeah. So I want to take everyone through. So right now, if you look at the the UI of this mockup, you have everything broken up into broad categories. So you have by, by function. So you have smoking, vaping, dabbing, dabbing, accessories, hemp and CBD, cannabis, and within that, you get finer and finer. Uh, product sorting ability. So for instance, within smoking, you see, okay, you select hand pipes within smoking, then you can keep narrowing down the subcategory of hand pipe by type of hand pipe, by color, by length. So for customers, we, we make it easy for customers who know nothing and for customers who are masters of everything cannabis related to find exactly what they're looking for. The other key to our platform that sets us apart is the ability to search by product effect. Um, you know, I like to say that grandma doesn't doesn't care whether it's blue dream or purple crack. She just wants to know what'll fix her glaucoma. <laughs> so by give, so by giving the ability to, uh, you know, sort by whether something will be energizing or 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 help with sleep or with pain relief, we make cannabis not just easy, but we make cannabis useful. Um, and that is that is really the the gist of it. I think if you if you look at our our overall business model, you know, as of right now, this is a slightly out of date, but there's a you know about 700 or so dispensaries in California. Uh, you do the math, and that's uh, you know, we, if we sign up all 631 dispensaries at the average of 112 orders a day. That's you know 127 million dollars of gross transaction fee revenue, which is enormous. I think also no, you, you got six at... minutes, and if you want to take any questions, perfect. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take questions. Okay, so question time. Who has questions? All right. Um, maybe I'm missing something here. Wave Zach, at me, please. Zach has his hand up. Okay. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, so I'm just watching the chat and it was kind of a question that I had as well, but a lot of people are kind of asking, how is this different than weed maps? So weed maps, it, so I, I, I could go on and frankly an entire rant about, about <laughs> weed maps from the 60% of their reviews that are fake and done by bots to the fact that for the longest time, weed maps was just a glorified inferior version of Yelp. Now, you know, where you could, you know, look at reviews and, and look up products by name. But, you know, an earlier version of our pitch was literally, you know, if the typical experience is going on weed maps, uh, calling up the dispensary, texting them a picture of their ID, and just, you know, 10 steps of, of barrier between buying and receiving. Um, weed maps now is, you know, trying to, to, to put on a better face. Uh, first and foremost, with with weed maps, we're not, uh, you know, being sued by states for putting illicit dispensaries up, so we're not a liability to invest in. Um, more, more importantly, I have never seen a customer who has told, who has said to me, "I really loved my experience ordering on weed maps. I felt like I was able to find exactly what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted." That that is what Bud Buddy does. We make it easy. Weed maps doesn't. Perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. I have a question from the audience, actually. Yeah. Um, would a dispensary have to change POS, which I believe is point of sale, to use your system? What if they didn't send to switch POS? I guess they're talking so, about discussing, trying to understand what the switching barriers would be. Sure. So in, in terms of, so we, we do require that, that dispensaries use our point of sale system because, you know, the biggest issue right now is that if an ordering platform has to use one of a bunch of uh, different POS systems, they have to make sure they work well with each one. 
And that is not only leads to more errors for both the dispensary and the ordering platform, but it also creates more moving parts and issues for the customers, which ultimately hurts the dispensary if those customers you know, don't place an order or have a bad experience as a result. In terms of transitioning, um, our, we do make it very easy for customers to export their existing data and POS software from their old system to their new one. And I'm happy to, to talk to any, speak to any concerns about that with any investors or customers after the, the panel as well. But, but we do feel, to, answer, to directly answer the question, we do feel that uh, having dispensaries use our, our point of sale system and, and in, be within the larger ecosystem is a, is a key part of our platform. Okay, and there's another question from the audience, right? Um, so aren't they now using two point of sale systems if they have still have to use one in their store? No, because they, they basically, so exporting data is a one-time process. So they basically, if, if they signed up with us, uh, they'd be exporting their data from their current POS system and then be able to immediately use ours. So they would no longer be using the initial one once that uh, prior data was exported. Okay, and Peter Casper, did you have a question? No, okay. That's did not, apologies. No, it looked like you were waving at me, so that's why I was wondering. Okay, well, let's let's uh, let's summarize then. Uh, if you could tell me in 30 seconds or less, give me your elevator pitch, Noah. 30 seconds sure. or less, tell me why I should consider your opportunity, why we should go out on a date. Ah, absolutely. So the opportunity here is that BudBuddy makes it easier to, to uh, order and receive cannabis products than it is ordering takeout food. We put everything in one place, make it easy to find what you want, find what you're looking to feel and experience based on product effects and get it delivered quickly and easily fast. That's a wrap. Sounds great. Okay, well, thank you, Noah. Thank you for your time. Good to see you, you here. Your first time I've seen you here and Look forward to seeing you back. It's a Absolutely. good place. Happy actually. to be here. And uh, I like your style, by the way. I, I apologize if I was laughing. It's, <laughs> I like your, no uh, your thing about your grandmother and the, and the crack. I mean, that's hilarious. You know, I, I got to remember keep that. It real. No worries. All right. Anyways, let's move on. Presenting company number seven Oliver Horn, CEO, Elixino Global. And I just want to say, I have tried your Omega turmeric product. Ah. I think it's awesome. Uh, you're a rock star, John. Thank you very much. Let me, um, let me share my screen. And look, I'm calling you from Australia, Melbourne. Um, so I hope you're all doing well on your side of the world. We're certainly watching what's going on. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, look, just you know, to make most use of the six minutes, um, I'm the CEO of um, Elixinol Global have been for a year. And it's a publicly listed company in Australia. So it's on the ASX, um, but it's also on the OTC. Um, and yeah, we are basically a CBD and hemp expert. We've been 20 years in, in CBD and, and, and hemp, um, really starting with hemp foods, hemp proteins, um, and various food sources uh, around hemp. Um, but we also have a very extended skincare range um, and also the Elixinol um, CBD range, which you can you know, find in, in the US very widely distributed. Our vision as a business is uh, fairly and squarely to build a, a global hemp derived health and wellness consumer products business. So we've rejuvenated ourselves um, throughout the course of the last year, really focusing on CPG disciplines and creating consumer products and consumer marketing, disvesting ourselves or getting out of um, lower value B2B and, um, and bulk services, for example. What makes us unique um, besides the, I guess, um, you know, besides being 20 years in, in, in hemp really, and being a pioneer, a pioneer in the area is, is our global footprint. So we've really over the last couple of years invested into global markets because the trend around CBD in particular and hemp as well you know, is quite remarkable. So. In Americas, we have um, our base in Colorado, around 40 people. Um, we have about global revenues at the moment of 15 uh, million, um, half of that coming really out of the Americas. Um, but really interestingly, over the last two years, we invested ourselves very heavily into Europe um, and have been in there since 2018, had a real first mover advantage. It's now around 20% of our group revenues 
Um, but that market is set to explode. We're expecting a 34% CAGA rate on growth and getting to 2.3 billion uh, market opportunity. And we've been there with an early mover advantage. I'm gonna to talk to you in a minute about also an acquisition that we've made there, which is really um, exciting to get us even deeper into Europe. And on top of that in Australia, our business, Hemp Foods Australia, uh, which has been operating since 1999, 20 years, um, you know, is delivering one third of our revenues. Um, on top of that, we have various um, distributors and partners in, in Mexico, South Africa and Japan. We're licensing our brand out. It's just being relaunched. So I guess what you can see, you know, we're one of the very few publicly listed companies that has a truly global footprint with a diversified um, revenue stream, which insulates ourselves um, against risk in certain countries. And certainly we've seen the Americas are challenging at the moment, uh, but then participating in this great growth that's happening um, all over the world. Um, to give you an insight into our European footprint, just um, taking the UK, UK, by the way, is um, Europe's biggest CBD market at this stage. We are really well distributed. Um, over the last year, we landed um, over 2,000 new distribution points. Superdrug is um, one of the biggest drugstore chains um, that we are in. Well Pharmacy, independent pharmacy chains. Alliance Healthcare is a wholesale distributor um, to 20,000 um, healthcare practitioners and pharmacies, boots in Ireland, um, and a number of e-commerce operators as well. Plus, we're supplying to Pharmacare, which is a, a big player. Uh, we're uh, supplying all their, um, their CBD products under co-branded range um, that's powered by Elixinol. So really significant um, foothold into you, um, the UK market, which makes us um, very different. Um, touching very briefly on our financial um, summary, look, we've, we've been through a reset and I came on um, through the course of last year, I've been in the role now for 11 months to turn the business around. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, um, we were mounting pretty big losses on our EBITDA line. Um, you see that you know, at some half, the previous half, first half 2020, we had 15 million um, EBITDA loss. And really the work that I've been doing with my management team is taking the cost out 45%, pretty much half the cost of the business, um, taking out all the low value items, bulk and private label. You see on the left-hand side, they were a big part of our business. And then most importantly, we um, refinanced uh, ourselves with a heavily oversubscribed um, capital raise. Uh, we wanted to raise only 2 million from um, from shareholders, but um, we were oversubscribed with 27 million of offers. We took in 20, 20 million in, um, in funding and I've now got a, a really strong balance sheet. We had 28 million cash in the bank, no debt. Um, and so what you really see is like a clean, cleaned up uh, financial position, taking cost out of the business um, and reinvested a lot of our time and money into relaunching our Lixmo brand. You know, if you've taken the Omega one, that's a part of our new range. We only launched that um, in March, April, and we launched it around the world. So completely new business, um, consumer centric, uh, margin and, uh, and brand focused on a lean cost base and in a very stable financial position. So we are really well funded. But what I want to you know, so get on your radar today, um, we've just announced to the market this week on Monday um, that we are, um, have a proposed acquisition that we're putting to our shareholders in May for vote um, to acquire Germany's number one um, CBD brand. And you see that in front of you, the company is called Canacare. The brand is Canovo. It's the number one brand in uh, bricks and mortar, four and a half thousand retail distribution points. Um, and their success really has been very early on in creating a strong consumer brand by um, going into broad reach distribution and drug stores, where they're the number one, but then supporting it with national television advertising. And when you Google it, you can see a number of spots that have been running last year. So they really cracked the code to get a startup business going, get it to 3 million euros um, uh, revenue, make it profitable. It's already profitable. Um, and it's now the number one brand in, in Germany. And what we're really excited about when you look at their distribution footprint uh, with one of our four and a half thousand um, stores that they're, they're servicing, which includes- Oliver, you have six minutes. Thank you very much. I'm fit wrapping up in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see that um, we are really well positioned in the German market. So it's an acquisition for us 
um, which is an upfront consideration of 9 million, maximum 24 million um, euros. Um, but you know, it's going to change the game for us as we are now in the UK, in Germany, um, you know, in really two strategic markets on top of the US, on top of Australia. So I guess what I want to leave you with sort of as a, as a elevator pitch is think about us as a, um, you know, being positioned in our global markets that are high growth CBD and hemp markets. We've been in the markets for a long time. We're a 20 year long old established player. We have a publicly listed company that is extremely well funded with a strong balance sheet. We have an optimized cost model now. We've taken the cost out. We're focusing on brand building. Um, and we're continuing our global expansion to take you know, part in this exciting trend that we see around the world. And I guess why we're here um, today, we're looking for retail investors and, and uh, sophisticated investors, us sitting here in Australia. We don't really get the message enough to America, um, which is actually a home country for us and hence you know, reaching out to you and putting us on the map because it's a different business than Elixinol was just a year ago. Um, so that's it. I guess we take it over to questions, John. Thank you. Okay, that was good. Thank you, Oliver. Um, good pitch. Um, who has questions? I'm looking for the little hands. Anyone? Okay, Ted Bernhard. Go ahead, please. Yep. Thank you. Uh, very impressive presentation, sort of related. Um, uh, you're, you're, are you, am I understanding you correctly that you are raising money to sort of increase your profile in the in the US, uh, because it sounds like you have a pretty strong balance sheet and don't really need a lot of <laughs> Yes. No, we've, we've actually, we're actually well, well funded. We are not raising money, yeah. we don't raise money. So there's no dilution moment coming to any shareholder anytime soon. No, it's more about, we, we, we just retail investors, individual investors, institutional investors, sophisticated investors, they don't know about us in America because we're in Australia. Gotcha. Yeah, and so really this is about, um, you can buy us on the share on the OTC, um, very, very easily, but we just haven't marketed ourselves. And that's a missed opportunity. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that's great, thank you. And then the second question, um, uh, I, I, that, it was great to see the product mix there. Uh, and you sort of alluded to this, the, the regulatory uh, framework in, in the US for marketing CBD type products is kind of a mess. Do you, do you see that changing? And how do you see the mix of your uh, products between the different geographic regions. Yeah, uh, look, good point. I think we are expecting that the FDA regulates um, you know, f um, CBD as a dietary supplement. Yeah, and I certainly have that expectation that we see significant yep. movement in the second half. So that should really give us a tailwind for the industry, uh, which we also necessarily need and better regulation. So that's one. Uh, but Ted, the most exciting thing is that the European Union, the World Health Organization, the United Nations um, you know, declared CBD not a narcotic. And now the European Union has passed um, a binding um, um, judgment in all European countries to, to adhere to that. And now we are positioned in those countries and that gives us a huge opening of those markets. And that's incredible growth for us. That's very exciting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted, for the question. Okay, David Cram. Hey, Oliver, uh, <clears throat> this is David Cram here. Um, great presentation. I've actually been familiar with your company for years. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that, you know, this turnaround is happening. Um, outside of being an M&A acquirer, um, given your upcoming proposed acquisition, what would you say are the other exciting growth levers to this business, maybe more organically than um, inorganic growth via acquisition? Yeah, so I think there's um, a couple of things that um, are really exciting opportunities for us. One is the market entry to Asia and to China in particular. Um, look, Australia is very close to China and we have a lot of trading ties. Um, so it's a very easy platform. I think that is uh, uh, something that nobody talks about. The Asian market is not really well discovered. Right. Um, so I, I think that's, that's one. Um, Australia has just changed their regulation to descheduled CBD. It's um, you know, from a special access scheme and it's going to become a, available in, in pharmacy. And, and that's our home play. So you know, that's a natural opportunity for us. Um, yeah, and then I think there's a, a massive category expansion. I think the time of plain CBD tinctures and oils is gone. Um, you know, the, the market is becoming more sophisticated and we've got a pretty big R&D facility to get come up with better IP. I don't think there's enough IP. And so um, I think that's a part of our investment strategy as well. So there's a number of avenues of growth, economic recovery, regulatory environment. Everybody knows that. Uh, but then there's geographies, geographies which we can access, which are you know, huge. 
Awesome. Um, and one and one and one sorry, quick follow. David, forgive me. I have to um, uh, yield to John Thompson. Just a quick question, John. You have less than a minute. Wrap up. And I suggest to all the panelists. Uh, the, and the judges that you uh, contact Oliver Horn. And I'm sure Oliver, you've got somebody in the chat will help you. A good presentation, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, what, what do you see the path to profitability on your business? Look, we've, um, uh, we don't provide any forecasts, um, John, uh, but there's analysts out there which are covering us, um, you know, and they expect us to be profitable um, towards the tail end of 22, early 23. 23. Hey. I, I see that you have thousands of stores that you're in right now. I mean, yeah. is, is the volume, is the velocity in those stores really what's inhibiting the, the top line? Yes. You're spot on, John. Like footfall in retail has been atrocious. Yep. I mean, everybody in the industry can probably attest to that. And unfortunately, uh, we- oh, Oliver, lost... sorry. I have to call time. Forgive me. No, you're right, John. That's, that's only fair. Thank you. Okay. Now, on to our- last presenter but certainly not our least presenter uh peter casper founder and ceo terply that's t-r-p-l-y uh peter please take it away awesome thank you so much let me awesome. just get everything set up real quick yes still see the see the page Yep, I see it. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, shoot. So, hello everybody. My name is Peter Casper and I am in the problem solving business. We're in an industry here where there are lots of problems that the average business doesn't face but as an industry where every single statistic is telling us that the stats are booming. There's lots of money being made. But there's also lots that's being lost. The federal government isn't in place. There's no right to use banks. You can't cross state lines. All things other businesses have, things that require us to be especially effective and efficient for bringing in new information and driving profit for businesses. Today, I'm happy to debut Terpley. My solution, to some of these inefficiencies. Primarily, the fact that we understand little about how cannabis actually affects us. There's way more attention on the medicinal properties. Terpley is focusing here on the recreational properties. The issue for brands and producers, primarily being the fact that they don't know who their customers are. Because when data stops at the point of sale, how can you understand what, you act, like what your actual consumer likes about the products that you're making? and the consumer can't predict product effects before purchase. Honestly, with the high price point of cannabis goods, this is an extremely frustrating situation because you can't return your products and consumers deserve to have confidence with their purchases. And you might be asking, oh, but you already have Indica, Sativa and Hybrid for these labels. But according to a recent survey on LinkedIn conducted by Cody Peterson, a cannabis pharmacist that I'd recommend you follow, only 11% of individuals found these labels for indica and sativa to actually be helpful for determining what their products will do for them. And we continue to interview various users, cannabis enthusiasts, and repeatedly we found that product effects were the primary consideration, both when they were selecting products, as well as the main pain point over their cannabis journey, costs coming in second to that. When it came to the reliability of packaging information for determining these effects, on average, consumers rated it as a two out of five. So we interviewed various brands to understand their process for diagnosing product effects. 86% of them said they relied on subjective experience for determining how to label this product for the rest of the market, which we know is flawed when you know that everybody's affected by cannabis uniquely and everybody knows someone who's tried a product and decided it wasn't for them when in reality, it probably just wasn't the right cannabis product for them. When we interviewed them to understand their feedback process as well, 50% said this process for getting feedback from the consumer was anecdotal at best. The other 50% said it was non-existent or too difficult to pay any mind to. The elegant solution for all this, Terpley, a free mobile app for consumers where they can get scientific product insights 
and community reviews to better help them with the product discovery process. You can see on the left side here, our first prototype of our product page detailing the terpene profile for this particular product. Additionally, users can get localized product suggestions and discounts from our partnered brands, retailers, and point of sale systems. Not to mention our integrative review system means that the more consumer reviews, the better the recommendations get over time. And this is something that they can take across markets as well. On the brand and producer side, you'll be able to get actionable customer and product insights, as well as product forecasting on the chemical analysis through a subscription data dashboard. Not to mention that we'll be offering enhanced ways to engage with our users through our affiliate and ad programs as well. And we're expecting this impact to be massive. Consumers now have support from the scientific and community level intel. They can get cheaper prices for their cannabis goods and purchase products with confidence. Retailers will be able to elevate their bud tenders to our bud tender platform and be able to help better market products efficiently and improve the overall patient outcome. And on the brand side, they finally get to understand who their target customer and market is so they can design the product that are fit for their target consumers and overall increase their customer loyalty. We believe this market opportunity is massive. With data sourced from MJBD for all the licensing information, we're projecting this to be almost $2 billion when you look at the entire US. It's almost half a billion when you narrow it down just to California. And with just our current capabilities, the Turpley team, we're projecting this to be $10 million opportunity. The competition is also very fragmented. Currently, we have players like BDSA, Headset, Trees, Leafly, and Weedmaps who are providing out market intelligence, but are really stopping short when it comes to arming consumers with tools to take into a dispensary and look at the product they're holding in their hand. Relief and Lucid Green are the first ones that have consumer facing applications, but they're either focused on the medicinal properties, they lack the personalization or product recommendations from their previous usage. The way we operate is very simple as well. We analyze wow. lab data from our partnered I brands. lost access when I open up my we, excuse me, we uh, analyze lab data from our partnered brands, retailers, as well as lab integrators. We provide our product insights down for our consumers, incentivize a review system with discounts and deals, and then generate consumer insights, which we provide back to retailers and brands as our primary form of making money, our data subscription dashboard. They can now understand their customers and markets, evaluate different product trends, and access their very own lab testing data. Additionally, we'll have different streams where they can push product suggestions through a recommendation engine, as well as sponsor affiliate products and brands through our affiliate program. Financially, we're projecting to reach profitability between years two and three, and have additionally laid out our CAC and LTV metrics down there below for you guys to review. The team that's bringing this together is myself, Peter Casper, who has a background in applied mathematics and finance, finishing up my MBA from USC Marshall, and someone who has completely dedicated his career to the cannabis space. From founding and leading the Marshall Cannabis Industry Club, USC Marshall's first graduate level business of cannabis organization, to working at Trava Capital, a cannabis SPAC headed by James Parker, the former CFO of MedMen who took them public, who's now an advisor and one of our lead investors. We've also onboarded a key hires here as well, from a branding and marketing perspective, as well as our front end and back end for product development on top of a robust senior advisory team covering executives across the, in, across the industry from flower hire, MedMen, and acreage holdings as well. Moving forward, we're seeking a half million dollar raise at an $8 million valuation, particularly from preceding angel investors and seeking out our brand and retail partnerships as well. This industry is rife with problems, but it doesn't have to be. Terpoli is here to drive more efficiency into the marketplace. Thank you so much. Happy to take any questions. Okay, anyone, questions? Who would like to lead off? Okay, Dr. John Thompson, go ahead, please. Hello, sir, uh, great presentation. I, I love software. I, I think it's, it's awesome, it's the future. Um, can you go with over again with me what your revenue model is? How, how are you going to, who's going to pay for this service? Absolutely. So primarily it's going to be our brand and retail partners who will be subscribing to our dashboard, as well as utilizing our affiliate and ad programs as well. Um, have you considered white labeling any of that 
it, would you do a like a brand based uh, app? So specifically just a brand. Mm -hmm. So we believe that'd be kind of leveraging or wedging ourselves too closely into one corner of the market. This has the potential to reach every single market that has a legal cannabis market. You All can we still need aggregate the data though. You, you could still aggregate the data, uh, I guess. Uh, I'm cu just curious what your thoughts are on that. A big issue for the consumer base that we've developed so far is access to other branded products. It can be too hard for a consumer, especially with how fragmented the market is and how many brands are on shelves to only go to one particular product. Judges, anybody have any questions? If not, I could take one from the audience. Um, this is a comment. This is a complicated and crowded space. How does your data collection relate slash, front slash compete with other data groups like headset.io? 2 billion isn't a lot of TAM. I don't know what that stands for with several competitors. I guess total mar access market. So Yes. So primarily BDSA, headset, trees, all of those go to the point of sale. They stop at the retail level. So you can understand basket sizes, different consumer preferences for what they're purchasing, but we have no idea how people are actually engaging and interacting with these products, what they're actually recommending, how they're feeling as, as a matter of fact afterwards. Brands need to design products for their consumers, not for the bottom line. Designing it for the consumers first helps the bottom line, but you can't use operational efficiency to drive your impact for consumers. You know, I wish that I was an investor judge because my background is software and I love to ask you questions, but not this time. So Maybe judges, offline. Yeah, offline. Judges, anybody <laughs> have any questions? Okay, well, I think we can then wrap that up for now, Peter. I, you know, I like your presentation and just talking to you, I can feel my IQ going up. Uh, <laughs> I'm used I to working it. with people a lot smarter than myself and, uh, you know, having spent many years in software, all I can say is that uh, this is interesting. So Thank you. we're going to wrap it up now. Thank you, Peter. And it is now time for voting. Uh, judges will each select one company to give their vote and a pop-up window is now available on your computer where the audience, you, will be able to vote for your favorite company presentations. So I hope you see the, uh, the pop-up. And by the way, I'm not allowed to vote. I can only stare. So there it is. And as a reminder, by the way, to the audience, to everyone, you have access to the presenting companies and investor judges information and contact information at the Cannabis Investing Forum website, www.cannabisinvestingforum.com. Uh, I strongly suggest you check out the website. There's actually some really interesting content in there. Um, uh, Brad gives away a lot of analytics, frankly, that, uh, quite su that I'm rather surprised at. So very interesting. So. I'll now start and ask the judges what company presentation they voted on and why they made this choice. I'm gonna allow each judge to announce their winner and I will proceed in alphabetical order with first names, starting with Carol Ortega, Tega, Algara. Carol, one to two minutes. Why did you pick, who did you pick as the winner? Well, great presentations today. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, for always choosing leading opportunities in the space. Uh, I really like uh, Claudia's. Um, it's great to see women in the space. Very interesting. And um, I like uh, Voyager. I like the, the fact that they have uh, uh, a strong intellectual property and a, a patent going on. I like uh, that the, the opportunity uh, will allow us to have a probably successful exit. So I will vote for Voyager. Voyager, okay, number one, Voy Voyager. And I'm doing this manually. I should have probably wrote a script for this. Anyways, um, now Cletus Mack. Um, I know you had some issues before. If you're there and you'd like to vote, uh, let me know. Otherwise I'm gonna move on to the next judge, Cletus. 
going once, twice. If you get this message, you're free to ask me at the end after I've chatted with the other judges. Okay, let's move on to David Cram, uh, co-founder and managing director, Profarian Sapling. Yes. Um, okay, I think every pitch was impressive. I think everyone did an excellent job. However, in my role as a real estate investor and someone who obviously tilts toward plant touching opportunities, the winner in my mind is Nate at Fast Flower, Fast Flower Farms. It was an excellent presentation. Um, great answers on some of my questions also and everyone else's. And um, we also happen to like the state that he's doing business in. So he gets my vote, but great job, every, everyone else. Yeah, no, good presenters here, good presenters. Thank you, David. Okay, let's move on to David Wise, Chairman and Founder, Infinity. Thank you. So uh, again, great job with all the presentations. Um, uh, David Cram seems to be taking my questions <laughs> before I get a chance to ask them. Sorry, bud. <laughs> That's all right. And in this case, he also uh, has the same pick as I do. Uh, the reason that I, I, I chose Nate and Fast Flower was that they seem to have the uh, greatest opportunity for any investment to turn into real return on investment, where the other companies just didn't seem just didn't seem to get me there or seem to know how to get there. Or if they did, something wasn't was missing in, in the picture. Got it. Got it. You know, David's David's think a lie, huh, David? <laughs> okay. Dr. John Thompson, founder and CEO, Extract Lab. On mute. All right. Hey, uh, I think everybody did a great job. I appreciate all the uh, presenters today. Um, I am pretty partial to um, software and software systems. I think data is always going to be the future. It's going to win. Um, and the faster you get started, the better. I think your projections are actually a little bit um, too low, um, Peter. So I, I would I would vote for the Terpley app. Um, I think uh, there's lots of opportunity if you could work it out um, for, you know, for example, um, some sort of a white labeling and, and just push it out. And then you're still aggregating the data. The data is where the money's at in my view. So um, that's where my vote goes. Um, I'm still uh, very, very much so interested in the CBD uh, Denver. That's the second runners up. I don't know if you can, you can do that, but um, I was pretty impressed with how they made money. I still don't know how they're doing it, but I was, I was very, very impressed with that. So, um, so thank you very much. Yeah. Great, great commentary, John. You know, uh, we all know as investors that we have our own preferences, our own profiles, our own risk, what we're willing to do. So it's not a reflection on any particular company. I personally like investing in pipes and private uh, placements, but that doesn't mean that the early startups aren't good. I put money in there too. So it's an expression of a risk profile. And I think that's important that everybody understands that. So Ted Bernhard, Managing Director, Cultiva Law. Thanks, uh, boy. This is thanks. Thanks everyone for these presentations. They were all really, really good quality, and I very much enjoyed hearing everyone's presentations. I've learned I've learned uh, something about myself in the process of this. Uh, I I didn't know how appealing the international markets were to me until I heard the pitches from um, the CBD of Denver and Elixir All Global. I thought those were both uh, uh, really really solid uh, investment opportunities, but I didn't choose either of those as my finalists because of, they both seem like they're semi-public companies and trading on the OTC and th things like that, that uh, it, until I got a better handle on their publicly available data and the, um, the, the uh, structure, uh, I couldn't do it, but both great presentations. I think you both have great market opportunities, but uh, I ultimately came around to the same thing as the Davids uh, here and, and Fast Flower Farms was the one that I, I liked the most uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, it wasn't a business model that I've never seen before. So I, I almost dismissed it, but the, the detailed understanding of the business and the little things that, that seemed to come through the presentation really 
uh, impressed me great, greatly. And, and there was one line in particular that just hit home that, that was, uh, you know, don't bet on the horse, bet on the jockey. I just have a lot of confidence in that management team and in the market opportunity in, in Michigan expanding elsewhere. So um, great job. Fast Flower Farms gets my vote too. All right, great. And finally, Zach Bernion, Real Estate Acquisitions, Cannabis Venture Partners. Yes, thank you again, everyone, for presenting. Um, I personally went behind uh, Peter Casper as well. Um, I'm very big on education. Um, I look at cannabis as it is a medicine. It is not a drug. Um, and I think that a lot of patients that need cannabis as a medication really need to know what they're taking and what the exact effects are. And that does kind of sound like what exactly Terpley is going for. So Terpley has my vote there. Okay. I'm just waiting to find out who won for the audience. Okay. And let me see. Okay. So th this was close. This is interesting. The audience chose Nate Nihus, Fast Flower Farms. I thought that's interesting. So judges and uh, the audience. Interesting. And then Marcel Gamma came in very close second on the audience. And uh, I have to say, all of these pitches were good. Um, I personally love software. I think software will eat the world, but that's just me. So let's, well, I guess that wraps up the investor pitch competition for today. So um, I want to thank all the investor judges and presenting companies. You did a really great job and we appreciate the effort you put into your presentation, the investor judge and the judges as well. It's a lot of work doing this. I, you know, it takes a lot of effort to, to, to actually pay attention to really sort of tease out the details. And uh, we also want especially to thank you, the audience for joining us today from all around the world, 36 countries, five continents. I mean, that's amazing. We would like to remind the audience and the webinar participants the recordings of today's presentations will be available on the Cannabis Investing Forum website and YouTube channel. For those of you that would like to contact the presenters and investor judges, their emails are available on their section of the Cannabis Investing Forum. And I would like to bring back the Master of Ceremonies, but before I do so, Dr. David Kunick, before I yield the floor, I'd like to acknowledge the high quality of the presentations. I just want to repeat that. I mean, it's amazing. They just get better and better. And I would also like to give Dave, Dr. Dave, Dr. Dr. Dave, double PhD, love it. And Brad Turner, a shameless plug. For anyone who is new to this industry experience, but doesn't know have a good deal of experience raising capital, I strongly suggest that you reach out to Dr. Dave and or Brad Turner and work with them to improve your pitch and lead generation. You usually get only one chance before a typical investor group. So make sure you're putting your best foot forward. I don't work for, with Dr. Dave or Brad Turner and I don't get paid for them by them. I just like what they do and I do this for fun. It's my pleasure being here and thank you for listening to me. <laughs>